praise the Lord. The Bible says, He is the Ancient of Days. He is the beginning and He is the end. The Lord existed before there was anything else. He is the Almighty God. Therefore, He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our glory. We love Him today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Glory to your name, Jesus. Glory to your name. We honor you, Lord. Praise you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You need this. You need the presence of the Lord. You need his presence. This is the only way to receive his presence. Talk to him. You have to receive his presence on a personal level. You can't receive his presence through some means of food or drink. You can't receive his presence through electronic means. I can't give you the presence of Jesus Christ. Neither can anyone else. You can't inherit the presence of Jesus Christ. It will not come to you in a letter can't be delivered to you through a delivery man. You've got to experience him on your own in a personal way. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And it is such a refreshing, it is such a revealing when you when you come into his presence. It's wonderful. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. I said it Wednesday night the primary purpose of the bishop, the pastor of a church is to talk to God on your behalf and to listen to God on your behalf. And I believe I've heard from the Lord and um, I, I just want to speak to you from the scripture today <clears throat> and I'm not going to follow my message that the Lord gave me. I'm going to follow what the Holy Ghost is leading me to talk to you about today. And I want to just to turn our Bibles to Acts 17 and 11 and I want us to stay in this vein of the Spirit and uh, a reminder that we have a prayer tonight at 6. We have prayer tonight at 6 here at the church. This is our normal monthly prayer night. We're going to also continue to say, as Sister Rachel has said, we have prayer Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday and Friday. Of course, church Wednesday night here at the church, 6.30 to 7.30, and then 10 to 11 on Saturday morning. It's going to be that way for the next three weeks. Of course, there'll be some nights that because of breakthrough we will not be here but you all have keys to the church so whoever gets here first come on in Thursday and Friday night and we'll be at breakthrough turn the lights on dim the lights and uh, make sure you lock up after you're gone but it's very important that we meet for prayer it's very important that we begin our year in prayer and that you clear time in your schedule to do this uh, because we need to come into the kingdom of God with unity and, and you say, well, I'm already in the kingdom of God. It's very important that we stay in the mind of what God wants to do with his church. And, and salvation is only the open door. It's only the beginning. The keys that Jesus gave to Peter, that Peter released on the day of Pentecost, were simply the way to open the door. And if you never step beyond the door, you've never stepped into the kingdom. So we want to come into the kingdom. We want to go into this year with unity in our minds. Acts 17, 11 these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Amen. I want, I want to know the word of the Lord. The Lord promised through his prophets of old that he would do a new thing, that it would spring forth. He promised it, it was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. But that was 2,000 years ago. We live in a world that is constantly looking for something new, something fresh. I've come today to tell you that what is old is new. And that's what I'm talking to you today on the subject of what is old is new. It's still new. The presence of God is still springing forth. The power of God is still fresh. It is still springtime new in the presence of God. In His, in His presence there is fullness, which means completion of joy. Not just a little bit of joy, but a completion of joy. In his presence there is fulfillment. The fulfillment that you have not found in your life, I'm telling you, you can find it in Jesus Christ and then he will help you align your life with his will and his precepts and you will find fulfillment in your life and his presence is fullness of joy. Everything that you need is found in the new 
and in the springing power of Jesus Christ. What is old is new. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I'm asking you to speak to us today, but I, I definitely, Lord, I, I desire, I, I strongly covet your presence upon me because I'm just a human being. Please speak to me and touch our ears to receive the word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. You have seen churches that were named Berean. You may have known there was a while or uh, in ancient times when they still had Christian bookstores. They were There was a chain of them across the Midwest called Berean Bible Bookstores. People like to use that term to identify themselves because the Bereans were people who were hungry for the Word of God. They were more noble than those in Thessalonica, the city that is today called Thessaloniki, Greece in which there was an ancient church, a strongly established church, which Paul wrote to at least two times as he spoke about prophecy and the coming of Jesus Christ. <laughs> the people in Thessalonica did not readily receive the word of the Lord. They did not have a readiness of mind, and they did not search the scriptures whether those things were so. But the people in Berea did search the scriptures and did desire what Paul had preached. The people in Thessalonica either did one of two things with the scripture. Either they did not receive it or they did not search the scriptures because they did not care enough about it. They just took the pastor's word for it. And, and no matter how much I appreciate and will receive respect that you give to the ministry and to me, and I'm thankful for that because the church doesn't really work right if people don't respect the pastor, amen? amen? I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to search the scriptures. I want you to have a relationship with Jesus Christ through his word. Right. I want you to be able to read the word of God on your own. In fact, it doesn't matter what I want. I, I want that, and it's that's what I should want as a pastor. I want a church full of people who understand the Word of God, a church full of theologians, if you will, on different levels. Uh, but what matters more than that, what I want it is that God wants you to want that. Yes. If you want to be noble in the eyes of the Lord, you will study the precepts of old in which you will receive newness of life. Praise God. Yes. And so they dug deeply into the Scriptures uh, and did find out that the apostles were preaching right. Paul was preaching correctly. Silas was working miracles among them as they were doing things. And they found out as they began to dig into the word which was not readily available like it is to us. But they had to study what scrolls they had available through the local rabbi as they began to study. Now they didn't have the New Testament either. They studied the Old Testament uh, and they also spoke of things that they had heard about Jesus. Uh, and as they began to dig into the righteous acts of Jesus Christ and the law and the prophets, which is another phrase for the Old Testament, they began to find out, yes, these things are so. These things are correct. Uh, but they were not simply receiving the Old Testament when they searched the scriptures. They were searching the Old Testament to find out the foundation for what Paul and Silas had been preaching to them in Berea. They were preaching from the Old Testament. Now, I remember my uh, youth leader for a time, Brother Gary Cadness, who's now a pastor in Corinth, Mississippi. He asked us to come to a uh, Friday night youth group, and we had, we had the best youth group in the world, okay? And I'm a little biased, but Brother Lonnie Mitchell, who has now gone on to be with the Lord, many years pastoring in New Albany, Mississippi, was our youth pastor that started a group called Just Friends. Mm. I believe it was 1988 when he started it, and we decided that every Friday night we would start youth service at 6.52 p.m. And so we had a fantastic time. And it was a group of young people. The whole idea of Just Friends was that we were just friends. There was no pressure. We were just going to come. We were going to hang out. We were going to hear a lesson from the Bible, and we were going to do all kinds of things and take trips together. We had a fantastic youth group. And the work that Rachel and I did as youth pastors have done over the years as youth pastors and youth leaders, even working with the youth of this church, has been in part based upon that youth group. One of our youth leaders uh, in, in coming years after Brother Lonnie went on to pastor was Gary Kappas. And he said, I want you to come this coming Friday night. And I want you to be uh, pretend like you have never had access to the New Testament. And I, we're going to have a panel discussion. And we're going to defend... Jesus Christ using only the Old Testament. And it was awesome. It was really fun. I got a, a, a bathroom towel, tied it around my head to make me look like a Bible character. And uh, instead of 
the, the pants that the Arab sheiks wear. Uh, I, I wore my Mississippi State uh, burgundy bulldog sweatpants and a long shirt, and I got a big curved scimitar, plastic scimitar, I stuck it in my belt, and I came in there like I was a scholar from ancient days. And I spoke with, an, I, I was, okay, you know me, okay, actually, y'all, I should say, y'all don't know me, because I walked in there speaking with an Arabic accent, and I defended against all of the three, with the three other people were, were going to be people that said Jesus wasn't God. And so we had to pretend like we were in days uh, around the time that Jesus was born. People denied him, disputed him, didn't believe that he was real. The Bible says he came into his own and his own received him not. And so I spoke and he was shouted with an Arabic accent as I used only Old Testament to prove that Jesus Christ was God. Because I understood from a very young age the power of the Word of God. And because what my dad and what my mom and what my Uncle Paul and what my brother-in-law had put into me, I searched the scriptures and I had a desire to prove who Jesus Christ was. Let me ask you a question today. Do you know what is old? Is it new and fresh to you? Do you know the word of God? Do you search the scriptures? Or is church just something that fills up a small portion of your life? Because as I have said to you recently, and I will say again, there's only one way to live for God. And that is with 100% of all that is within you. With all of your heart, with all of your mind, your soul, and your strength. If someone was to present to you today the question, what do you believe, or ask you, can you prove what you believe? What basis is there behind what you believe? What would you be able to answer? How would you be able to explain your experience with God? Would it be simply, my pastor said this, my pastor said this. Now, there's nothing wrong with asking your pastor for questions. And there's nothing wrong with not understanding everything that your pastor understands about theology. But there is something wrong with not having a relationship with the Word of God for yourself. There is something wrong with, with you not knowing that what is old is new. If it's not, if it's just old hat to you, if it's boring, if it's just a dusty scroll at the, or, or an old book that you never opened, Open up in your house. Uh, if it's something that you never receive in your heart, uh, then that is a serious problem. If you do not have a daily relationship with the Word of God, you are not going to be able to live for God. And I want you to live for God. I want you to understand the Scripture. I want what is old to be new to you. When you receive it, praise God, every single one of us, it's like everybody gets a re-gifting. It's like when you get something that's re-gifted for Christmas. Uh, it, whether you know it or not, if it's something that you wanted, it's exciting. Even if it's used, if it's in a package. Now one time, I, when I was in Bible college, I bought myself something for uh, a costume party. It was, it was a Terminator arm. So when I put it on, it looked like I had a robot arm. And it made noises. And I wore an all-black suit with a black tie and the Terminator arm and sunglasses to the costume party. And then I went home for Christmas to spend time with my family and I decided I was going to give that like I had bought it to my two nephews. So I gave them, I gave two boys one present. Is that a good idea? That's a terrible idea. So my brother-in-law, Brother Powell, Bo Powell, said it would have been better if you had just got them nothing because now they're just going to fight over it. It would have been better if you had just got them nothing because now they're, go they're not going to be able to receive it. And that was a lesson that I learned at a very young age, that you have to have something that is re-gifted to you personally. The Lord didn't come and just slap a big Bible on the church. He gave us the ability to receive the Word of God on our own basis. He gave us the ability to receive the Word of God for ourselves. But if we receive it like Thessalonica, either, oh, I trust the pastor, I don't have to search the Scriptures, we got the best pastor in the whole world, so Brother James, I don't need to ever study the Word of God. Or the other way, I'm not worried about that. I just come to feel good. Yes. Question. If you just come to feel good, how do you feel good? Who are you connecting with to feel good? Who makes you feel good? Is it the people or is it the presence of God? And if the answer is I come to feel good for the presence of God makes me feel good, then I want to ask you this. Do you really think that the presence of God is only here to lift you up emotionally? Do you think the presence of God does not deposit the deposit things in your spirit that will draw you to change and be altered? There is only so far we can go, good, go with the feel-good uh, argument. 
There's only so far we can go with it. There's only so far that the Thessalonians could go. But the Bereans said, I don't want to know just how the apostles Paul and Silas make me feel when they preach. But we are going to delve into the word of God because we feel like when they preach, we've got a hold of something like a live wire. And it gets deep down with inside of us. And yes, it is the old scriptures. It's what the rabbi used to preach. And it used to be boring. But now it is real. And so I searched the scriptures. And I found out that this Paul and Silas know what they're talking about. They're not lying. contrast here. Yes, the Thessalonica church, it sounds like they did eventually get themselves together. We know that culture makes a huge difference. I'm getting ready to release another podcast. It's with Brother Alan Demas. And uh, I talked to him. He, he was a uh, veteran missionary for over 40 years, starting in the 70s, going until uh, probably about maybe about 14, 15 years ago, he and his wife from this area, from Minnesota, and uh, his wife from Wisconsin as well. But they uh, pastored churches and were missionaries in Germany and pastored churches and were missionaries in Greece. Two different, two completely different cultures. And so I talked to him about the difference between cultures. You know, the word of God is going to be received differently. Uh, and and I, I know and have heard from European missionaries how over the years, you know, the, the plodding along of the European, the growth of the European church has been much slower than that uh, of Asia, especially in Southeast Asia, and also of Africa and Indonesia and the Philippines. Those other cultures have received the word of God so much faster. And I can tell you, as a part-time missionary myself traveling to South Asia, the word of God is so easily received by people in that area. But this is a difference here between two different communities and two different churches and two different cultures. They were both Hellenistic cultures. They were both Greek or Greco-Roman cultures. They were both under the Roman Empire. They both had the same money system, the same road system, the same postal system, and the same mean, stern-faced, bullying Roman soldiers telling them what to do, but they came from different stock. They both both of these cultures had the Celtic background of all of, uh, of Asia Minor, which is what the same culture that, that Augustus Caesar conquered from England all the way to northern and central Turkey. They had the same backgrounds, but there was different ways that they received the word of God because their cultures were microscopically different on their local level. One culture caused them to hear the word of God and to feel the power that comes when the word of God is being preached in an anointed way. One culture allowed them to receive that quickly. One culture allowed them to receive it and take it for themselves. And when you have ownership of something, I said, when you have ownership of something, it doesn't matter if it is old. It feels new to you. <laughs> it doesn't matter the age of the building. It doesn't matter the type of people that are in the church what they look like, what their ethnicity is, their job situation, how much money they have, or their family background. If you go join a church that's been around for 100 years, but you are attending a church that's only been around for five, when you go to the 100-year-old church, you're going to a new church. Because you begin to feel, and when you begin to connect with that church, you feel like it's new for you. The Word of God is the same. The relevance of the Word of God has nothing to do with its age. The relevance has whether or not it is able to be plugged into your and my lives and for us to be able to receive from it that which is meekness in ourselves, receiving the engrafted Word of God, which is able to save our very souls. Is it relevant for you? If it's relevant for you, it has nothing to do with whether or not I, as the pastor of this church or this congregation, is able to exist in the 21st century, but it has everything about uh, to do with whether or not this church receives and preaches the true and unadulterated word of God, because if it was as it were, 
in the, in the, in the story and understanding of Brother Stephen Dross, who for a time had a church under a mesquite tree in the Norteño border region of northern Mexico, right in the middle of the cartel. Is it a church? You better believe it was a church. Did it have anything modern? No. I don't even know if they had a PA system. And he told the story about how one of the lieutenants came up with him and his suburbans and their AK-47s to the mesquite tree to come and give their bag, their, their manila envelope full of cash drug tithes to church. And he said, I can't receive your tithes and I can't let you bring your AK-47s into the house of the Lord. And so they left their guns and their suburbans and came and sat down under the mesquite tree and wouldn't give their many thousands of dollars of tithes to the church because it was a church. You know why? Because it had a pastor. Because it had a congregation. Because it had some people from northern Mexico that were hungry for the word of God. And because the people were receiving the word of God and receiving their pastor. And that mesquite tree had even what, what, what the pastor probably knew, but what the what the drug cartel lieutenant didn't know was there was a couple angels hanging out above that mesquite tree. And God was providing them a home for them to have a church service in. And many, many things happened because the guy got busted uh, by the DEA, which was running uh, operations there in northern Mexico, working with the federales. And the guy was sent to Houston. And he went sent for Brother Drost and said, I want you to... Get that white preacher to come here to Houston to tell me about this Jesus. Get that white preacher that wouldn't take my money. <laughs> and he came and he baptized the man in Jesus' name. He was baptized with the Holy Ghost. You know why? Because some people in a little town in northern Mexico decided that what was old was new for them. It was fresh. It was exciting. It was real. It was a did something inside of them. Began to have a reaction. And God began to move in their spirits. And a church was born. That is what makes the Word of God relevant. It doesn't matter if the Word of God is from the King James Version, the New American Standard Bible, or the Messy Version, which is what I call the message, because it's not really a Bible, it's a ridiculous paraphrase. So it's not a translation. What matters is, is the word getting into your heart? Is it getting into your spirit? Are you able to connect with it? Now the scripture goes on, and I'm, I'm not going to keep you very much longer, but verse 12 says, Therefore many of them believed also of honorable women which were Greeks, and of men not a few. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached at, of Paul and Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. So Thessalonica did not receive the word of God with readiness, did not search the scriptures, and therefore they were carnal. So they came to cause problems. Then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go, as it were, to the sea, but Silas and Timotheus abode there still. And they that conducted Paul brought him into Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus, for they, for to come to him with all speed, they departed. So Paul had to leave while he was waiting in Athens for them, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. So the city was completely more so. The Bible infers that Athens was more so in idolatry than other cities that he had been in. So, so now we read this scripture, of course our thought is that we're worshiping idols. Now we have just as much idolatry in our society. In, and I'm not talking about people that are worshiping uh, and, and praying to Buddha and to Shiva and to poverty and all of these other gods, I'm talking about the idolatry of worshiping things and relationships and money and jobs, etc. So we have just as much idolatry, we are just as much given to idolatry. The Bible says in verse 17, therefore disputed he, because he had a burden, he spoke up in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him and some said, what will this babbler say? Other some, other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him to somebody that they respected, 
a man named Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is where, whereof thou speakest. So these Epicureans, the Bible explains to us, were the Facebook of their day. Why do I call it that? The internet benefits from novelty. The internet makes its money from novelty. The only way for you to ever succeed running a YouTube channel or having a business based off of Facebook is to work harder than you actually would have to work in the real world. You have to pour your life into it. It will be a 24-7 endeavor because, let me tell you something, without great help and without great advisement, you cannot succeed on the internet. You know why? Because the, you are connected to billions of people who have better ideas than you are, and you have to work way faster than them to keep up with this. It is a society that it exists in the virtual world among people who are not living in the real world, and their ideas are constantly being one-upped and trumped up. And so this is exactly what the Epicureans were doing. The Epicureans were constantly searching for something that was new. And when Paul came on the scene preaching this, it was, this is what's new. And God met them through this level of understanding that they had, which is, we don't know the truth, but we're just going to listen to what is new. They lived in a non-judgmental society. The Roman society was as hedonistic as we are today. Again, remember, we are not in unparalleled times. It has been like this before. In the days of Paul and in the days of the apostles and the days of Jesus, the Roman Empire was hedonistic, meaning it was a feels-good, do-it society. And the reason people were able to do that is because for the most part, most people in the society were free. And for the most part, the economy was good, so people were able to do whatever they wanted to. Some of them were wealthy enough to sit around in a theater talking to Areopagus under the heading Epicureans, which is where we get the the word, uh, the root for the word culinary, or the word epicurean, which is to mean studying of food. Food was one of the things that they worshipped, and food was one of the things that they studied. Anything to be new. I want you to know something. When the Word of God came on the scene, it created a reaction, because the Word of God is both old and new. If you think for a second that, that God is going to fit into your frame of reference, uh, you've got him wrong. God wants you to fit into his frame of reference. When you get to know him, you get both old and new at the same time. Therefore, he's able to be relevant to an ancient world and able to be relevant for our grandparents and our children as well as he is to us right now. I want to hear this new doctrine. We're not ever going to decide anything, but we're going to sit around talking about it because it makes us feel better. For thou bring us certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Now, I'm not going to go on, but the powerful message that Paul stood up and preached on Mars Hill, explaining to them, how their unknown God was God manifest in flesh through Jesus Christ that came down and hit them like a lightning bolt right between the eyes. It was both old and new at the same time, and it met them right where they were. I'm telling you today, the oldness of the gospel is its foundation. The newness of the gospel is its freshness, and it is reviving to you and I. And it will bring us to a place where we can be changed. The doctrines of this world cannot do that. This world will listen to anybody that will not speak of a, a, an, a subjective truth. An objective truth, excuse me. This world will listen to anybody that will not tell them the difference between right and wrong. This world will listen to anybody that will say, this is what I do, but I dare not suggest it is good for you. The only thing this world worships, according to our culture, is honesty. As long as you're honest, you can be whatever you want to be. Now that in itself is a lie, because that's just a mask. It hides all sorts of other things. And the people of this world are never truly honest with anyone, including themselves. That's why they were masks. But when we come to Jesus... He lays everything bare. The Bible says the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. The Bible says the Word pierces even to the dividing asunder of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. 
The Bible goes right through to it. The cultures and doctrines of this world, the religion of, religions of this world, do not answer the fundamental question, who am I? They do not give you the tools that help you understand who you are. They cannot help you identify with anything other than something for a brief moment. It feels good for a moment. To, and maybe the religion is connected to smoking a little weed like it was uh, on the hill where I met all of the sadhus. Uh, but I couldn't take their pictures uh, because they were smoking weed and they wouldn't let me take their pictures uh, unless I gave them a little money for a little bit of extra ganja. It doesn't, uh, it, it, it could be connected to drinking. Maybe your religion is connected to drinking. Maybe your religion is connected to a relationship. Uh, there are some religions that are connected to sexual intercourse. Uh, maybe your religion is connected to a crowd because you felt some sort of enthusiasm when you heard that doctrine. It doesn't matter what it's connected to. If it's not, not connected to the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, it will fail. Yeah. Because there will come a time when that doctrine that you received uh, in that moment, uh, it filled you with enthusiasm and charisma and joy that will not last unless it is connected to the word of God because you must be connected to what is old in order for you to have the newness of Jesus Christ in your life. The Holy Ghost that we feel today, it is fresh. It will change your life if you'll repent of your sins. If you'll be baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of those sins, you will be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Speaking with tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance and you will never be the same. You will have bad days. You will still have troubles. But you will be connected to a source of power that is like none other. And you will have a connection that gives you a freshness uh, and a spring-like newness in your step uh, every day. Even when there's two feet of snow outside, there will be a joy in your spirit. Uh, because what is old is new again. And the Epicureans and philosophers and Athenians uh, and every alpha guides of this world uh, will be stuck in their mud puddle not able to get out of it when you are free, yeah. absolutely freed by the blood of Jesus, by the name of Jesus, by the spirit of Jesus Christ. What's old is new again. It's real in this place today. The power of God is real here today. What Paul and Silas preached, the same message that God brought in a prison at midnight is the same message that God allowed a prison at midnight as they sang praises unto the Lord because it is new. Hallelujah. And it's real. I make the call to you to come and pray, to let Jesus touch you, to not merely receive what I'm saying and take my word for it, but to receive what you're feeling instead and what you heard from the word of God as something that you can own for yourself. I've come today to tell you about the price that you need to pay to receive this. I've come today to tell you that the price of this message that I have preached is a beautiful offer for you, but you can't afford it. It's a really good offer, but I promise you, you can't afford it. The price of this message today and the price of this word and the price of what Jesus did for you, it's beyond gold. It's beyond silver. And you are never going to be able to afford it. I've got hope for you, though. Jesus has already paid this exorbitant cost. He has gone so far as to allow you and I, no matter how unworthy we are, and no matter how empty our pockets are. See? Nothing but lint. Oh, okay. I had a peppermint. Sorry. I don't want to lie in the pulpit. It's not lint. It's a peppermint. I got nothing. And I'm not worthy of going before Jesus Christ, and neither are you. But this priceless, ancient gospel of Jesus Christ is still good news. It's not good olds. It's good news to you. If you will repent, which means, Jesus, I confess that I am a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. Why, why is it good to, to do that on your knees? Because the Bible talks about kneeling before the Lord. You don't have to do that. But it's a good thing to do. If you don't want to do that, then sit and stand. But in your heart, kneel before a holy God and say, God, I acknowledge that I am less than you and that I'm not my own Savior. Forgive me of my sins. I acknowledge and confess that I am going to turn to you. You are my Savior. Please forgive me. 
and fill me with your spirit. He will fill you today and touch you. This altar is open. Would you come and pray? Thank you, Jesus. What's old is new again. Would you come and receive this? I can't get it.